Hello and welcome. I'm Esther Allen, a professor at City University of New York, and I'm here with Allison Markin Powell, who translates Japanese literature, works with the Penn Translation Committee, and has been a driving force co organizing Translating the Future, which is the conference you're now attending. Thank you, Esther, and thank you all for joining us for the eighth installment of our weekly program. Today is Queer Literature, Queer Legacies. We'll be listening to a conversation between Achi Obejas and Sean Bai. Achi is an author, poet, and translator based in California, and Sean is a translator of Polish literature based in New York. You can read their full and glittering bios on the Center for the Humanities site. Unfortunately, Liz Rose, the translator who organized this panel and who was meant to moderate it, is unable to be here today. But we do have these words of theirs to share. Let's take a moment to acknowledge that it's Pride Month and there is important work happening right now in the US toward black liberation and queer liberation is interconnected with black liberation struggles. The Stonewall riots were led by queer and trans women of color and it's essential to consider queer history and the queer legacies that have created the context for the work we are, do we are doing as LGBTQ writers translating queer literature. This series of weekly one hour conversations is the form that Translating the Future will continue to take throughout the summer and into the fall. During the conference's originally planned dates in late September, several larger scale events will happen. We'll be here every Tuesday until then with conversations about the past, present and future of literary translation and its place in the world where we find ourselves. Please join us next Tuesday at 1.30 for 21st Century Translation, What Has the Future Brought Us? We'll be joined by Gabriella Pagefort of Amazon Crossing, Samantha Schnee of Words Without Borders, and Chad Post of Open Letter, as well as possibly one other participant. Uh, and we'll hear about the ways they've used data and technology to raise awareness and determine what and who gets translated. Please check the Center for the Humanities site for future events. Translating the Future is convened by PEN America's Translation Committee, which advocates on behalf of literary translators, working to foster a wider understanding of their art and offering professional resources for translators, publishers, critics, bloggers, and others with an interest in international literature. The committee is currently co-chaired by Lynn miller Lachlan and Larissa Kaiser. For more information, look for translation resources at PEN.org. Today's conversation will be followed by a Q&A. Please email your questions for Sean Bai and Achi Obehas to translatingthefuture2020 at gmail.com. We'll keep questions anonymous unless you note in your email that you would like us to read your name. And if you know anyone who was unable to join us for the live stream, a recording will be available afterward on the HowlRound and Center for the Humanities sites. Before we turn it over to Achi and Sean, We'd like to offer our sincere gratitude to our partners at the Center for the Humanities at the Graduate Center, CUNY, the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center, the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, Penn America, and also to the Masters of Dark Zoom Magic at HowlRound, who make this live stream possible. And now, over to you, Sean and Achi. Am I here yet? <laughs> <laughs> I can hear you, but I can't see you. You can hear me, you can't see me. Oh no, wait, <laughs> this, there we go. This, this, is, this, is, this is live internet streaming here. <laughs> hi, Hachi. Hi, hi, Sean. See you. <laughs> well, um, do you want to start uh, with a, a reading? Yeah, why don't we start with a reading? All right, let's do that. You go first. Me me first? Okay. Yeah. Um, I think, so I, um, I'm going to read something from a, a book that I have coming out in the spring um, called uh, Foucault in Warsaw by uh, Remigiusz Ruzinski. It's a translation of mine. Um, and it's a book that takes the, the year that Michel Foucault spent as a diplomat in Warsaw in 1959, 1960, as a starting point for an exploration of, of queer life uh, in, the, in, in the city and in Poland in that era. Um, and so I'm going to read, I thought I'd start with something outrageous. I'm going to read something about cruising. <laughs> um, uh, the cruising in Warsaw in this time happened 
uh, often in public urinals, which the characters in this book refer to as mushrooms. Um, so you're going to hear two different, uh, two different uh, uh, real people. This is a nonfiction book talking about uh, talking about cruising in this period. Different methods of cruising. Queer life happened on a sort of trail. The mushroom on Three Crosses Square, another one on Zelenetska Street, and a third on Dombrovsky. But they all wiped that out. Capitalism came and it was over. It's a story that's impossible to tell because it was, it was like a peacock of paradise or a unicorn or both. And they tell the story. Once I picked up this handsome guy on the street. I said something and he said something back and now we're walking along together and talking. I opened with, you know, you're such an outgoing great guy. I'd love to take you for a coffee. But he was sharp and goes, man, aren't you wasting your time on me? Aren't you better off picking up some girl? And that opened my eyes that if somebody's on the ball and not interested, they'll say no. I've also got this personal theory that every good looking guy in Warsaw must have had a brush with gayness because there were so many gays cruising in all kinds of situations. And the only way to avoid it was by being ugly. You get lots of different situations with cruising. One of my girlfriends did it where she pretended to be a TV director. She had a lot of nerve. She'd go to the beer stand on Świętokrzyska Street and promise the boys a career in television, which put her in very high demand. There was one rule, never mess around with vodka. All my friends who died, it was because of vodka. It's really dangerous if you're into trade because you never knew why he kept meeting up with you. There were different methods of cruising. There was no buying sight unseen. You'd know right from the get-go, which was an advantage. That's why everyone liked hitting up the tea rooms. There were tons of urinals. And so the queers would do a circuit of the mushrooms moving from one to the other. The metal barrier around them was high enough off the ground that you could count the legs underneath. The police would drive up and if they saw legs grouped together, they'd storm in from both ends and hunting. They'd arrest one guy and the rest would skedaddle. And that's what our gay era was like. It was a terrible way to live. First of all, the police chasing after you, pounding you with truncheons. You'd run away, then get dragged to headquarters for interrogation. And second of all, there was no normal way of meeting people and murders were the order of the day. Well, I found it all incredibly exciting because come on, these were hardly everyday experiences. <laughs> Just to give you a little flavor of the time. I love that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. What was the word in Polish that you chose to translate as queers? Uh, it's um, chotka, chotki, which is related to the word for aunt or auntie. Um, you know, like a, like a relative, like your, uh -huh. your father and mother. So it's actually a feminized word. It is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Huh. Um, and there's, there's a lot of that, there's a lot of that gender play in, in this book. There's a lot of men referring to one another as girlfriends or as her. Um, and, you know, also, you know, gender bending in their actual everyday lives, you know. Um, it's definitely... It's a picture of a time when, when being a gay man and being very effeminate were very closely related to one another. Right. And in fact, it's one of the things that the characters in the book talk about reflecting on how gay life in Poland has changed. That some of them even sort of lament the like masculinization of, uh, of gay male culture in Poland. Um, so I'm curious, why use the word queers, which is a word I like a lot, but why use queers instead of something like girls? which is also used among gay men a lot, especially if the, 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 the original word in Polish was feminized. Yeah, um, I do use girls in certain places and they do use dziewczyny, dziewczynki, girls. Mm -hmm. um, I felt like the, the word that I translated as queers is like, it, I felt like it has that kind of specificity of queer in English. I felt like it's something that has kind of a bit of a bit of valence and is a bit of um, and can be a bit disparaging in certain contexts. Like I felt like it was a pretty close semantic fit, but it was tricky. I did wonder for a while whether just to keep it in Polish. Oh, that would have been an interesting choice. Yeah, it was something I thought a lot about with this book. I um, I sort of made a decision to do my best to root the way they spoke in English in in actual like sort of American gay male manners of speaking in the 50s and 60s. And I did a whole lot of research with materials from that era and stuff so that I could really like tune my ear to that. But in the back of my head, there was also this voice going, well, actually, no, they need, they, they maybe they should sound Polish. Maybe they should be speaking some completely new type of English with lots of Polish words kind of 
intermixed with it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I don't know, I think I'm a better mimic than, than anything. And so I think I was more comfortable trying to replicate a way of speaking that I was maybe more familiar with and that I could research rather than trying to invent something completely new, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, I'm still, I'm still very fascinated by the use of, of the word queer. I don't want to keep like hammering on this, but it's because that if my experience with the word is that when I was a kid, you know, like in the in the sixties, which is not that terribly far from fifties, yeah. um, that was a very mean word. Yeah. It was there was no positive connotation to that that I can recall, and it, it there was a period of transformation with that word in English. I mean, I I remember being in college and that word starting to become something that we used ironically, but still not positively. You yeah. know, it was in you know within the 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 coven of lesbians, uh, you know, we, we would, you know, sort of mockingly refer to ourselves as being queer as a $3 bill or, you know, or, but it was, but it was very uh, domestic and familiar and insidery. Mm -hmm. And, and only, I think later, like in the nineties during the, the, the AIDS crisis that I feel like that word got retaken and recharged and, you know, I think of it as very much as a 21st century word, even though I think its roots are before that, but I think it really sort of blossoms and flowers uh, in this period. I also think it's really tricky to do stuff from other periods because ultimately your reader is still reading in this period. Yeah. So how far can you go? You know, I mean, you have to give them something to hold on to, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, and the, you know, the voices in this book, again, it's a nonfiction book and they're, um, he's interviewing people who today, the author is, you know, the book came out in Poland a few years ago and they're reflecting back on this period. Right. And so they have, they have a somewhat old fashioned way of speaking and they're using old fashioned gay slang in some cases. And there was lots of stuff I had to look up or didn't know. Um, but there, but it isn't really authentic to, to that period per se. It's sort of like transformed, you know, through the years. I spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, my older gay friends that, that I have in the United States, you know, and people who grew up in, you know, not, not quite the 50s, but maybe in the 60s and, right. and uh, the early 70s and sort of the, the way that, you know, the, the way that they talk has changed, but is still inflected by older, older types of slang and, and so on and so on. Um, yeah. Is it, what is it like with Spanish? I'm curious. Um, well, there's know, also so many different Spanishes, right? Well, that's just the thing, right? I mean, yeah. the thing about Spanish, I mean, I think there are two things that really sort of separate Spanish in a way. One is that there, there's this multiplicity of Spanish. Um, and, you know, it, a word that you might use, you know, very, uh, you know, happily in Havana will have a completely different meaning uh, in, in Mexico City. Um, you know, I remember I, I used to, I used to go out with this, Cuban girl who stayed in Cuba, you know, we, we had a kind of this, you know, transnational relationship. And the first time she came to Chicago, where I was living in, where there were a lot of Mexicans and the Mexican community is sort of wonderfully present. We were looking for something to eat and it was very late at night and we found this, uh, this Mexican place and there's a huge neon sign outside that said tortas. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we all know, you know, we understand what the food is, but in Cuba, that very much means like dyke, but in a really gritty way. You know? So she insisted we take many photos under the neon sign that said tortas. Um, so, so there's that part, you know, where you have to really think about, you know, who are these characters? Where are they from? What is the experience that, you know, sort of shapes them and forms them? Because then again, you know, the, the, that, that can make a big difference. And then obviously who's your reader? Yeah. But um, there's also the issue of the fact that Spanish is a very familiar language to uh, English readers, you know, yeah. unlike Eastern European languages where, you know, not a single word you said was uh, anything that I recognized. And, I, and again, you know, I, I spent a, 30 years of my life in Chicago, which has the largest Polish population outside of Warsaw, but it was, you know, um, but, you know, you, people use Spanish words all the time in English without even thinking about the fact that they're using them. So 
how you play with that is is um, you know both it, it makes it easier in some ways and also makes it harder in some ways. I also think that there's a, a fictional um, Spanglish. I think there's real Spanglish and I think there's a fictional Spanglish. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the, the, the real Spanglish is again, very regional. You know, the way people use Spanglish in New York is different from the way people use Spanglish in, um, in Miami and very different from the way people use Spanglish here in the Bay Area where I am now. Um, but I think that there's a kind of a literary fictional Spanglish where characters use um, Spanish a great deal more than they do in real life. You know, I mean, when I pick up a, a book and I see somebody saying, um, uh, no, senor, it's to the left. I go, no way in hell does anybody really talk like that. Uh, you don't address people in Spanish who you know don't speak Spanish. Um, and, um, and so that really complicates the notion of queerness because then it's like a sub language within a sub language within a sub language, you know, it's, um, it, it all changes so very dramatically. I find that uh, queer speak, if you want to call it that, can be very different in the Caribbean from the continent, from the Southern Cone. Um, the, the, and, and then within those spaces, it's very different. You know, in Peru, uh, when I was in Lima, I was completely blown away by the fact that drag queens seem to have like their own language. It was so different from everything else. And, uh, you know, the dykes that I was hanging out with were almost as mystified and as left out of it as, as I was, uh, which I was like, oh, come on, <laughs> but this is amazing, <laughs> you know? Um, so yeah, it's, it, it, it's, a, it's a different ballgame. And you're also challenged, I mean, uh, you know, with the gender issues yeah. of, of Spanish that can really mess you up uh, with a translation because sometimes very important, obviously, to avoid the gender markers, but sometimes the gender marker is the point of the exercise. Yeah. And then you can't bring it into, in, into English in the way that it, it's really meant to be. Yeah. It's a struggle, but yeah. it's tremendous fun, obviously. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, it's similar with gender in Polish. Polish is, is super heavily gendered. It's really, it's really, really difficult to get away from using gendered language in Polish. Um, and it's interesting, I, in some of my research before doing this, I, I was looking up um, non-binary um, uh, uh, language in, in Poland and gender neutral language and sort of like, how did non-binary people in Poland talk about themselves? Um, and I kept finding these sites that were like, dis, like articles in Polish describing the debate about gender neutral pronouns in English and then giving the English examples and saying these are how you use them in English and then kind of not and then just sort of saying like well we need to come up with our own solutions in Polish and then like not quite getting there and I thought that was really interesting because I sort of I think I was saying this the other day I've noticed this thing in Poland where in, it's almost like the, the center of gravity of the discussion around queerness is getting sort of pulled towards an American Anglophone framework, you know, where they're, they're like quite familiar, the queer community there seems to be quite familiar with the debates that we're having in the United States and are sort of exploring ways of, of applying those debates to their realities and their conditions, but are maybe like not quite there yet necessarily. Um, and so it's sort of, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm by no means an expert in, in, in Polish queer culture, so I don't, I don't right. know that I can necessarily draw any conclusions from that, but it's, it's just sort of a head trip as a translator into English, working with queer language from Polish, where it sort of feels like I'm, I'm conscious of like potentially operating in this weird kind of loop, you know. Right. What, what thing that can... there's, this, is, this happens with Latin America too, where a lot of the discussion is, is dominated by what's happening in the United States. But I think that it might be different for us because there's a, a long history of, of the US presence in Latin America. I mean, there's a gigantic shadow that falls on Latin America 
from the US. And the struggle of, for the non-binary thing actually is, uh, is, is, is actually a, a real, for me, it's a real example of that. You know, um, I'm, I'm sure you're familiar with the term Latinx, which is the, the very sort of ubiquitous uh, non-binary Latino uh, term that's being used in the US. I, I mean, and, and it's not a popular term in Latin America. Right. In Latin America, it's very, in fact, it's a very problematic term because it's absolutely unpronounceable in, in Spanish. Um, the X is barely present in, in, you know, regular ass Spanish, never mind in, in this particular term. And so there's been a move, especially in the Southern Cone, especially in places like Buenos Aires and Montevideo, to move to, you know, the non-binary E, you know, instead of Latina or Latino to Latine. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the, I, I think I mentioned this the other day too, that the president of Argentina recently gave us a whole speech using uh, the E instead of the X, which was, you know, monumental really in, in a lot of ways. Um, but part of the problem with, with also with the Latinx is that, you know, it comes from here, it comes from the US and it may be coming from Latinos in the US, but it's still the US. Yeah, yeah. And so it's, it, you know, there's a sense of, don't tell me what to do, you know? I mean, we will figure this out on our own. Yes, this is a good point, but damn it, it you know, it, this is a thing that, that, you know, we need to, to do by ourselves. And also there, there are also people who don't wanna let go of the gender, that the gender thing, I think, especially uh, among a lot of women who feel that, uh, you know, lesbians uh, have a history of invisibility, a history of invisibility, not just in general, but a history of invisibility within the queer community. And so that the, the A and the feminized gender forms are actually, you know, emphatic for them. You know, it's, yeah. it becomes something that a wholly different ball game. Yeah, that's yeah. much closer to, to the trends that I see happening in Poland, actually, is that if there's any kind of change in the way that gender is being dealt with in Polish, it's like a, a, a reassertion of the value of feminine endings, like particularly for things like job titles and areas where the masculine was taken as neutral and these kinds of things. Um, there was um, one of the main women's magazines in Poland, I remember did a, a sort of top 50 list of, you know, m the most influential people in Poland and making a point of using feminine endings on every single one of their titles, you know, even like your know, prime minister as premier ka, which you would never really say, in uh. Poland, um, but just like you know, asserting the presence of of women in in these roles. And yeah, so that's interesting. Do yeah, you, I mean, the other thing that strikes me with Spanish is that Amer the United States is, of course, also a Spanish speaking country, and there's right. a huge amount of Hispanophone queer culture that happens in the United States. Absolutely, uh, and in the Latin American, American queer culture, English or in Spanish. So, as a translator. How do you think about whether or not to tap into those ways of speaking, that kind of language that's used, those cultural references? Um, it's, it's tricky. I mean, um, a lot of the stuff that I've translated actually originates in Latin America, mm -hmm. like Ana Lucia Portela in Cuba and Rita Indiana in the Dominican Republic. And so what I've done, uh, you know, what, what limited amount of stuff I've done that originates here, um, has not necessarily been queer, but it's also been, it, that question arises. What do you do with this Spanish that is, let's call it for lack of a better term, native to the US, mm -hmm. but makes no sense in the rest of Latin America. Like this happened a lot with Juno Diaz when I was translating mm -hmm. him. A lot of the Spanglish that we read in his books uh, is not anything that makes any grammatical or you know, lexical sense in uh, the rest of Latin America. And so in some cases, you know, it depended what was going on, you know, we left it alone, I left it alone. And in some cases it was imperative to, to, to make it make sense to the Spanish readers. So we had to play with it. We had to correct it, if you want to call it that, or to, you know, at least make it less incorrect, you know, realign it in some way so that the reader could ultimately understand. I mean, I think, uh, one of the differences might, if he had been a queer writer, one of the ways that that might have played out differently was to sort of consider how much of that terminology, 
was about queerness and how then important it was to keep it exactly that way. Yeah, yeah. You know, whereas, I mean, uh, you know, there's uh, there's a school of thought that, you know, the most important part of this whole translation business is, you know, the reader, the reader, the reader, they have to make sure that they, you know, that they understand. But there's also this, I think, other school of thought, which is, well, you know, you you work together, the reader and the writer and the translator, you're all working together. And if you really want to get a flavor of what the writer is trying to say, you might just have to come over. You might just have to surrender to not necessarily understanding this term in your own language, but understanding it in terms of sound, in terms of how it feels in your mouth, in terms of, of you know, the expression on your face after you say it, you know? Like a lot of, of stuff in Spanish, especially in the Caribbean Spanish, ins and vowels, you know? And so your mouth is open, you know? Cuidado, <laughs> you know? Uh, and so you have to, it, it, that's part of it. That's part of translation too. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's funny. It's it's this old foreignization versus domesticization. Absolutely. Thing. But it's like but it's like taking queerness as the foreign part, which is another sort of head trip. Like it, I don't. Do, do, is is queerness far? I mean, I think this whole debate is is, is nonsense anyway. <laughs> you know, but it's like. Um, I don't know. I would like well in terms of audience, right? I definitely as I was translating this book. Um, I was definitely translating it with a queer audience in mind, and I was expecting that they were going to have certain queer cultural Absolutely. touchstones. And that was sort of a conscious decision on my part. I'm very happy to translate for queer people and pay no attention to what the straights are going to think about it. Um, Absolutely. But, you know, <laughs> but you know, I, I, that's that's sort of a luxury that that, that I have. I think in in some ways, and is maybe not always the. I don't know. Polish queerness is also not a million miles removed from American queerness. Right. You know, it's still in a in a European Western continuum. I mean, you know, conditions under communism when this book is set were very different. Um, the the specifics, the specific history is different. The kind of cultural dynamics are are different. But the overall points of reference, I think, are are more or less the same because you were still, you know, there was still this history of thinking of homosexuality as illness. There was still the, this history of like Freudian analyses. There was still the whole like 19th century structural homophobic like intellectual edifice that was just as operative in Poland as it as it was in the United States. So I didn't feel like I was explaining anything that was all too alien. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. and for Latin America, that all that you just said applies beautifully to the Southern Cone. Where there's a session with Freudian psychology, where there's, you know, this very sort of cosmopolitan, you know, arrogance about, you know, the intellectual superiority, blah, 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 connections to Europe, and we're really not Latin America, blah, 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 blah. Yeah. But it doesn't apply to the, the rest of the continent for a variety of reasons. Cuba, also communist, and has a, a really terrible queer history as a communist country with the labor camps and all the stuff in the 60s, the, the late 60s for about two years, there were camps where they um, where they just took away queer people, mostly men, mostly men. The women who were brought in were usually either caught, you know, in Fragante or they were, you know, bull daggers, um, very masculinized. Um, so, and, and it's a history in which, uh, you know, no one's ever apologized, no one's ever taken responsibility for it. So it makes, it makes it in a very strange way. So the whole country is vaguely obsessed with, uh, with homosexuality. And for example, a few years back, the, the, the Cuban Book Institute decided to put out its, its first ever anthology of uh, Cuban stories about gay people. Well, one of the things that just absolutely floored me was that the editors included a whole slew of stories by straight men. <laughs> and I was like, excuse me, <laughs> I just, I have a, just a little thing I want to talk about here, <laughs> you know, and they just didn't, they, they were like, no, 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 everyone, you know, we all talk about it, you know, and of course, and I knew that, of, duh, but, you know, the obsession is very different because there's a whole lot of guilt around with these camps and around the way that um, anti-gay policy played out in the 70s and 80s, and those people are still alive, those damaged people, those people who were absolutely wrecked by the, these terrible periods. On the other hand, you have, you know, a lot of, you know, 
in a lot in the con on the continent, you have a lot of, of, of very isolated queer people, yeah. you know, in rural areas, in, in places in small towns. I mean, it, you know, a lot of Latin America is still very, very, very rural. Yeah. And, and, you know, the thing about something like queer language or queer culture is that you need community to make it. Yeah, absolutely. You know? I mean, somebody who's busy thinking he's the only queer in some little town in Paraguay is not saying, girl, right. who's he saying it to? Right. <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. Um, so it's a, it's, you know, it's a very, it, you know, the story really, whatever the story is, really sort of demands its, its own sort of rules and its own sort of approach, mm -hmm. because again, so vast, the history is so problematic you know, so many dictatorships, <laughs> so many massacres, so many, you know, uh, you know, so many horrible histories really yeah. that where, where queerness is one more thing yeah. rather than the thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then are you conscious of how your translation into English sort of feeds back into the country today? Absolutely, and also, you know, there's a question of how much do you explain? Yeah. You know, I mean, do you footnote? Do you do you have to say, hey, um, you know, in case you don't know, you know, for those of you who have no Uruguayan history whatsoever. <laughs> you know? um, so yeah, you know, you have to really make uh, some important decisions along the way. You know, who's going to come to this book and why are they going to come to this book? You know, to me, this was a really interesting question with a lot of Rita and Deanna's work because mm -hmm. it, she she attracts a lot of people by virtue of being this very charismatic, you know, uh, music rock star person that has nothing to do with literature, but everybody knows she's queer, right? So if she puts out a book, oh my God, I want to read it, you know? And yet, you know, the book is based and, you know, all of her stuff eventually always goes back to the Trujillo dictatorship in some way and to if not the dictatorship itself the inheritance from that dictatorship um so how much of that do you do you have to backtrack to to make people understand that this is a legacy that this is not and that it's also not just her imagination that this is actually a real thing that happened this is actually um you know a, a, a takeoff on history, not a takeoff on this wild, crazy thing she thought up, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, those, those are, are questions that are always sort of popping up. And also because so much, of course, of the horrors of, of Latin America, regardless of how it's played out, sometimes involves US intervention in some way. And here we are feeding it back to American readers. And so do you wanna, how much do you wanna implicate you know, the reader in this and I mean, or, or educate, you know, there's a lot of, of, of play there. I mean, I know that there's, that Eastern Europe has its own demons, its own historical demons. Sure, it does. Yeah. I mean, and it's interesting with, in terms of Poland's queer history, I think probably the single event that people are most aware of um, in terms of queer history under communism was this big sort of secret police crackdown on gay people that happened in the 1980s. And it was called Operation Hyacinth. And, um, the the Polish secret police archives are are open now, and they're one of the main sources for this book, Foucault and Warsaw, that I translated. Um, and the secret police were super interested in queer people. And part of what the book is about is how like queer life was kind of inadvertently, extensively recorded by the secret police, you know. <laughs> and um, so it, it turns out we know all about where people went and you know who they were and who knew who and so on and so on. Um, but Operation Hyacinth, um, the files have never been found. And so it sort of stayed, in, and, and the rumor is that there were just huge amounts of material. So it was either, you know, the stuff is badly cataloged in the archive. So maybe it's just been lost, but maybe it was deliberately destroyed. Maybe there was something right. else going on, you know. So it sort of remains shows up in that. a shadow in people's memory. But it was also around the period of solidarity, you know, in international terms, it was around the period of the AIDS crisis. So it's, it's sort of like, it's sort of subsumed by these other things. One of the things I thought was wild translating this book, speaking of dictatorships, is that the secret police were interested in, in, in queer people, mostly gay men, admittedly, 
partly out of just a, this like your usual thing about like homosexuality is a vice and sort of like prostitution and drug addiction right. you have to stamp it out you know whatever else but they also recognized the ways that queer people were building informal networks and informal institutions and informal communities to support one another and they were afraid that those networks could be used um, as the framework for a political uprising at some point. Ah. That um, it was sort of like this whole like underground infrastructure that under the wrong set of circumstances could be leveraged against the regime. And of course, in a totalitarian re regime, part of the point is that like all of society, all of civil society, all of these kinds of organizations all exist kind of within the framework of the party and, and of the state. And so this was a framework that they didn't control. And it's crazy because it's, you know, it's just queer people trying to live their lives. And the government is convinced that it's that it's this political conspiracy that's trying to overthrow them. And so they'll arrest people arbitrarily and interrogate them and torture well, them and but it, get them they to- they were trying to overthrow them, right? I mean, ultimately, wouldn't that have been, I mean, I think marginal communities always create these networks that in some ways always begin just as a, a, as a way to communicate, to be together, you know, the black church, the gay bars, you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, and, uh, and, and eventually, I mean, you are a threat to the state, especially uh, uh, something like communism, where individualism is, is, is very problematic. And yet queerness sort of demands that you step aside and apart. I mean, queerness demands that at some point you say, okay, I am different. Yeah. I mean, it, I mean, we don't, most of us, the vast majority of us don't grow up in gay families so that we can look up and say, oh yeah, I'm just like mom. I'm just like my other mom, you know? <laughs> I mean, you know, we, 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 it demands that we not be a part of the collective, that we recognize ourselves as outside those, um, you know, definitions of society. And so that is inherently philosophically, I think very, very threatening. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, in terms of, of, of Latin America, there's a lot of that. I think Cuba in particular is a, is a very complicated place because pre-revolution, Havana was a very sexually liberated, wacko place. I mean, when they call it the, the they used to call it the brothel of the Caribbean. And the thing about a brothel in that sense is that it isn't just heterosexual, you know, by definition, I mean, you can do whatever and whatever. Um, yeah. And so, you know, there was a tremendous, in, in historical terms, there was a tremendous tolerance for a gay presence. Like everybody knew somebody queer, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, my, my I have, a, you know, a, a, an uncle who went to medical school who, you know, talked very openly about how his study group had, you know, a couple of gay men and they remained friends forever. Um, and everybody was very open about you know, the fact that these guys were gay. And it wasn't that my uncle was particularly liberal or particularly tolerant. I mean, I'm sure that if he were alive, and unfortunately he would have probably voted for Trump last time around, you know, just because, you know, Cubans do that in Miami. Uh, <laughs> so reflex. <laughs> but, uh, but, but there were ways of, of, of being tolerant that were also, I think, uh, uh, not defined as such, but sort of like, hey, you know, it's hot, it's the Caribbean, we're all doing it and whatever, you know. I mean, Reynaldo Arenas did it with chickens, for God's sake, um, you know, and with trees, <laughs> you know. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a different kind of mentality. Anyway, I, I think we're running out of time. So I was gonna try to read one short piece. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say, we should definitely close with another reading. Yeah, and I'm gonna read it in English and then I'm gonna read it in Spanish. Mm. It, it's very short. Um, this is actually from a book of poetry that Beacon is, is publishing next year, and it's my work. And one of the, one of the, the challenges here for me uh, was trying to decide how to present the fact that I sort of exist in both these languages, and that sometimes the languages interact and sometimes they don't. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, um, and sometimes the poems are, are very queer and sometimes they're not, but this one, absolutely. Um, it's called uh, The Public Place. And it's actually inspired by a, um, a lesbian poet named Olga Brumis, whom I have loved for a very long time. Anyway, here we go, The Public Place. I have been watching her for a long time. I've been watching this woman, this small frame on the grass in a public place, 
I have been watching the long dark hair fall like a web on her shoulders, the neck, the fine slender arms, the way she senses I'm here watching her. I am a spy. I am exploring, mouth open, the hard ribs of her body, the hips hidden in denim, the creases, the creases, the muscles that stretch under dark blue jean patches so tight. I'm a pirate. My tongue, the ship rising with the storm of each movement. I'm inside her. I'm watching inside her from behind the brown iris. I'm spying. I do not know her. I am her lover. I do not touch her. She rises, she stands in the grass in the public place. She is barefoot, soft feet, unaccustomed to being so naked. Those feet, white feet moving away from the grass, the public place, the imprint of her, of her still fresh on the grass, the public place, taking the intersection against the light with a vengeance, a dare in her white steps. She is barefoot. I am her lover. I'm the woman she goes to going home. El lugar público. La he estado observando por largo tiempo. He estado observando a esta mujer, su pequeña silueta sobre la hierba con, en este lugar público. Veo caer su largo y oscuro cabello como una red sobre sus hombros, su cuello, sus brazos delgados. La forma en la que ella siempre que estoy aquí observando, siente que estoy aquí observándola. Soy una espía. Estoy explorando con la boca abierta. Las costillas duras de su cuerpo, las caderas ocultas en la mezclilla, los pliegues, los pliegues, los músculos que se estiran bajo los parches de jean azul marino apretado. Soy una pirata, mi lengua la nave. Se levanta con la tormenta de cada movimiento cuando estoy dentro de ella. La observo desde detrás del iris marrón espiando. No la conozco, soy su amante. No la toco, se levanta. Se pone de pie sobre la hierba en el lugar público. Va descalza. No está acostumbrada a estar tan desnuda y sus pies blancos se alejan de la hierba del lugar público, su huella todavía fresca sobre la hierba el lugar público. Toma la intersección contra la luz como una venganza, un desafío en su paso descalzo y blanco, soy su amante, soy la mujer a la que va yendo a la casa. Thank you, that was really wonderful. <laughs> so, where are we? <laughs> Esther, are you there? <laughs> yes. Uh, We're here. Oh, thank you, uh, both of you, Alice and Esther. Welcome back. <laughs> what fantastic bookends to your conversation, the, the two That's readings. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, that wasn't really nice. <laughs> um, all right. Well, we have um, Liz, who would have been moderating. We will still manage to send in some questions. And I'm going to read the first part she has of her question is for Sean. In considering the translation of the femini of the feminized word anti in Polish, translated as queer, they're wondering if you considered using the word queen or if the word queen appears at all in your translation of this text. The suggestion of queen obviously draws on American gay culture. I'm going to pause there and let you, if you want to respond to that first. I did consider it, but perhaps it was, it, I, I sort of came across Queen maybe a little belatedly in my research process. Um, and I think if I'd, if I'd started thinking about it earlier, maybe I might have considered it more strongly. I think Queen would have accurately reflected a very strong division between feminine and masculine gay roles that existed in Poland at this time and also in gay male culture in the United States in this time. Um, and I think that that would have given me kind of like a stronger evocation of that atmosphere in the, in the United States. Um, I, I'm trying to remember if I actually did use the word queen at any point in the translation. I can't quite remember. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a tricky problem. And I, you know, I'm very conscious that it's, uh, 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 it's, a, it's a word that other people would have translated in other ways. And I'm not even, I can't remember exactly, but I'm not sure that I can translated it consistently one way or the other. I try to, when I'm, tra particularly when I'm translating character voices, I try to be led by the voice. I try to have sort of a crystallized idea in my head of what this person or a person like this sounds like in English. And I try to let that 
image lead me in my translation. And it sometimes does lead me towards inconsistencies or slightly away from the original text or so on. But I was trying to keep these characters really rooted in, you know, people that I knew, people that I knew about, people, you know, real people who, who, who I felt were sort of, who reminded me in real life of the people I was reading about in the book. Mm -hmm. All right, which for both Achi and Sean brings us back to thinking about how we might impose or not US queer culture on texts from other literary traditions. And related, I wonder about interrogating this notion of authenticity. What is possible or not when we're considering authentic queer slang across languages, cultures, and decades? Perhaps we should let go of notions of authenticity since creating translations of queer texts for a different cultural context in a different language creates its own sense of authenticity. Wondering how this relates to fictional Spanglish, Achi, the X ending used in Spanish in the US versus non-binary E, which you spoke of, and more generally how we use language in different ways in different contexts. Wow, that is a loaded question. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I mean, I think the question of authenticity is really tricky. I think it's a, I think it's a trap. And yet I also think it's something that we we really can't get away from because I know that, you know, if if something doesn't sound authentic, whatever that is, you know it and it takes you out of whatever it is you're doing. You know, I, I remember years ago reading a book that I'm not gonna mention the title of. Um, that was it was not a translation, it was a it was a, a it was written by an American, a white woman who'd lived for many years in Mexico. And uh, she was writing from the point of view of of, uh, of a Mexican character. And I, I, I must have been a hundred pages into the book and very um, sort of delighted with how well it seemed she was doing with that. I thought, wow, this, this might be like a book to teach because she obviously researched it so well. And then there came along this little scene in which a character, a little girl pulls and you know, has to pee desperately and she goes into an alley and she pulls down her panties and to pee, but she, the author chooses the word calzoncillos to refer to her panties. And this is a word that's only ever used to mean boys briefs. And it threw me out of the story so dramatically. And it was interesting because, you know, here she had spent years in Mexico. She'd done her research. She, you know, had managed to really gather things in a way that sounded real, authentic, if you will. And yet this one tiny authentic, inauthentic moment absolutely blew up the whole book for me, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so, you know, how much of it is something that, I mean, I think we, we need, we, Yes, authenticity is important. No, authenticity is not important um, because ultimately we also have to create languages for some of this stuff, you know? Um, when, when I translated Juno Diaz, there was so much invention involved in that. Um, you know, a, as you probably know, he is prodigious with the use of the word fuck. I mean, it's everywhere. And the interesting thing about fuck is that it's everything. It's a noun, it's a verb, it's an adjective, it's a command, it's, it's whatever you want it to be. It's the most flexible word in English. There is no such word in Spanish. What to do, you know? So we ended up, I ended up coming up, my, my reasoning being everybody in Latin America knows this word because everybody in Latin America goes to the movies. And when they go to the movies, they watch American movies. So of course they know the word fuck. And so I just spanglicized it. I just made it fucking and fuck. So this was invention. You know, it, does that word actually exist in Spanish? Of course not. Um, is it necessarily as ubiquitous as it appears in that particular text? Absolutely not. But it is true to the character that he was writing. You know, he uses that word that character so much. So, and to eliminate that word or to use the Spanish equivalent would have completely undermined um, 
you know, his voice, and I literally mean his voice, not just meaning, but his voice, the rhythm, the, the sort of pounding, the musicality, the way it, I, I wanted to be real to that too. Because the thing about Juno as a writer is that he does that, right? He creates these soundscapes as much as he creates meaning and as much as he creates scene. I don't know if that answers you in any way whatsoever, <laughs> but I'm feeling good about that answer. <laughs> um, so I want to build on another question that Liz had asked in another context, um, where you both talked about the impact of US queer culture on your respective regions, uh, Poland and Latin America. But Liz was actually asking about the opposite. As you translate Latin American texts for audiences in the US, is there any sense in which that too can become an attempt to shape US queer culture through the impact of these other places and these other experiences? Has either of you seen it go in that direction as well? Well, I mean, do American readers actually in any way, shape or form uh, give a cultural damn about anybody else? I mean, uh, <laughs> you know, I'm not sure. I, I don't know. I mean, you know, obviously when you're translating from, uh, let's say from Cuba or from the Dominican Republic, from, you know, Uruguay, whatever, um, you know, it's important to reflect some of that. Do I think about how this might influence American culture in some way? No, I never think about it because, because here's the thing. In, in, I think, like I was saying earlier, we're already so, uh, in Latin America, we're already so drenched in American culture. We're already such uh, a, a very, complicated place. I mean, there's nothing authentic about Latin America in the sense that we're fused, we're constantly fused, you know? Um, you know, the, the Italian influence is phenomenal in Argentina. It's non-existent in Cuba. Uh, you know, the, the indigenous presence in Mexico is, is amazing and, and extraordinary. And it's absolutely, you know, non-existent in, you know, the Dominican Republic in terms of popular culture, right? Um, you know we're we're so different and 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 we are we're such a mix of things already that it's very hard to talk about authenticity i think it's 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 a very problematic term you know it, like I, I love when people try to talk say about authentic cuban cuisine what the hell is authentic cuban cuisine because you know uh, rice and beans don't make any sense on, on an island where it's 90% humidity all the time and you have to spend six hours, you know, stirring those beans. I mean, you're gonna die. You know? <laughs> um, so, uh, um, I mean, obviously I came from somewhere else, you know? I mean, um, you know, when, when we make tostones, you know, that's not from there either, you know? I mean, that came from Africa, um, you know, I mean, I, I, and and the notions of of who we are is also very perverse. I mean, I the the here's an example: the the Cuban Capitol building, the, the Capitol building in Havana, is the exact replica of the U.S. Capitol building. Slightly smaller. Every Cuban on the planet will tell you ours came first. <laughs> Even though historically, we know that's not true. And the whole explanation of it from the architects is that it's based on some French thing. I mean, it's nuts. You know, there are all these myths that we have about ourselves in part because we're such a mix and we know very little about, you know, so much of the, of how we all got here or, or we don't want to talk about how we all got here because it involves rape and conquest. It's funny that you mentioned the capital. It looks very different now because the Russians gilded the dome. Right. So took away that resemblance, which I know. is pretty, uh, pretty evocative, pretty evocative. The Russians love the and that adds a whole other thing, right? <laughs> oh, totally. Um, so I think we have a couple more questions that have come in. Um, Allison, do you want to 
Well, there's so far we have um, one short question and one rather long question. So I'm going to go with the short one first in the hope of getting both of them in. Uh, this one is for Achi. How do you translate the food slang used in Spanish to refer to lesbians? Oh, that is very, um, very complicated. Um, you know, I've only done that with poetry. And so that gives me a whole lot more license to play. Uh, and also I keep a lot of it in, in, uh, in Spanish, even though there might be um, English equivalents, um, you know, it, and I mean, uh, you can say guava, but guayaba is a better word, you know, um, it, it, it just feels differently in the mouth. It's a little bit longer, um, you know, um, and I think the orality, the, the oral aspect of um, language, the food and sex stuff, and especially in the Caribbean, um, is really tough, but it's also really fun. I think you can, you can use a lot of food terminology. I think a lot of the, I, I, like I said, I think a lot of the ingredients necessarily stay in Spanish for me, not because they're necessarily specifically understandable words, but because sound wise, they make more sense, mm -hmm. you know? They, I mean, I'm sorry, but sour slop just is not the same as guanabana. Come on, <laughs> guanabana. Oh, I mean, that's sexy, <laughs> you know? So here's another question. This one is from Jeffrey Angles, who was one of our conversationalists last week. Um, and who translates and writes in Japanese. Um, uh, his question is, Carol Dinshaw has pointed out that one of the reasons that we gay people translate is because we're reacting to the paucity of the archive of information about gay lives in the past, trying to mobilize more resources for our own personal well-being and our fight against compulsory heteronormativity. In choosing text for translation, how much do you take these thoughts into consideration? And to what degree are you consciously trying to heal yourself or the field of queer literature by trying to overcome the historical suppression of queer work? Great question, Jeffrey. Yeah, I mean, that was something I thought about very concretely with, with this book, especially because it's nonfiction. It is a historical book. Um, and I'm not, I am not a, a queer historian, but I'm also not mega aware of history books in English about pre-Stonewall life behind the Iron Curtain. Um, and so I felt like there was a gap and it was something that people would be interested in, in reading about regardless of whether they're interested in Poland. Um, I mean, I, as far as choosing texts, I always say to people, I don't choose the text, the publisher chooses the texts ultimately, you know? And, um, and I think with queer literature, there's another dynamic, which is that the amount of queer literature that's being produced in a given country is not, you know, it's not the same everywhere. It's very dependent on what the political situation is in that country. Poland, for a place that's pretty homophobic, is do, it does okay in terms of, of producing queer literature, but it's not as though they're swimming in it, you know? Um, and uh, it's something that I'm always on the lookout for. You know, it's something that I do try to pitch around, but whether people are going to be interested over here or not, I was very lucky that, you know, Open Letter was interested in publishing this book. And it is something that I hope, you know, historians will get their hands on as well as just ordinary readers. Um, but uh, I do, in terms of my own healing, that part I'm not, I'm not so sure about, at least not in the context of, of this book. But um, I think that anything that decenters American queer history and queer experience, and particularly white gay male American queer <laughs> history and experience is good and is good for us and is good for all of us, so. Yeah, I, you know, I, I never, I never think about the notion of healing through any of this stuff in part because I, I that presumes a condition that I don't embrace. Mm -hmm. um, I, and, and, I, I am a, a big reader of history and a big lover of history. And I, I, if I had life to do over again, I think one of the things I would probably do is uh, skip journalism and study history um, um, because I, I'm always drawn to it. And, and my, my, my own personal work is always filled with um, 
historical stuff, I'm always, um, especially the, the little weird stuff in history, the, the stuff that you, you know, that, that's always sort of fascinating. Um, but um, I think, I mean, I'm with Sean. I mean, usually the publisher chooses. Sometimes I very much want to do something. I very much wanted to do Ana Lucia's, uh, Ana Lucia Portela's work, 100 Bottles on the Wall, which we ended up calling just 100 Bottles. I, I, I very much, um, you know, threw that at the University of Texas. And, you know, I, I thought it was a, a brilliant novel, not just a, around issues of queerness, but also in terms of sex in general and in terms of the Cuban revolution and in terms of how people operate when uh, they're in isolation and they're trapped and they're crowded. And um, it's also a very funny, very sad and tender book. It's also very violent in some ways. Um, and, you know, I, I'm drawn to the story. I'm drawn to language. I'm drawn to, to how writers convey particular things, you know. I mean, there are some writers who, I think may have more interesting historical work to offer, but if the story itself doesn't rock me, if the language doesn't grab me, I'm I tend to be less interested. You know, um, you know. Right now, if I if I had a, a choice of projects, um, I'm not the right translator for it. But if, if I had a choice of projects, I would. I would really want to do uh, Carolina de Roberti's uh, Cantoras, which is actually an English novel, but it's a it's it's a it's written in English, but it's about Uruguayan dikes. It takes place in Uruguay. Uh, she's Uruguayan. She wrote it about a time under dictatorship where these women had to create their own lives and figure out who they were in all these different ways. Um, and it's a brave book. Um, but I don't know Uruguayan Spanish well enough to really <laughs> pull it off. Um, and uh, it needs a translator who, who will love it in, in, you know, in, in its natural tongue, you know? Uh, but it, I, I mean, what an amazing book. I, I wish in terms of queer literature right now, that book just sings to me in all these very important ways. Maybe it will find its translator because of your saying so. that you just said. Maybe somebody out there in Europe yes, lies. Yes, out there oh. in the world. <laughs> we have thrown so down for the- all of our Uruguayan listeners. Um, we are out of time. Yeah, yeah, we're out of time. This was amazing. Us, this was great fun. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank you both so you. much. And, and uh, thank you for putting it together. Time. Um, lastly, we'd like to thank our partners again, HowlRound, PEN America, the Center for the Humanities at the Graduate Center CUNY, the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, and the Martin E. Siegel Theater Center. Thank you. We hope to see you next week. Bye. Bye.